Great day everyone, this is Jason Santos and for today, we will continue the discussion of labor economics and we are already on our second topic, which is all about the labor supply. So here is our coverage for this discussion. And let's start this uh, discussion with a quote from Ronald Reagan, he's a former president of the United States. And according to him, it's true hard work never killed anybody but i figure why take the chance so this quote is uh, just reminiscent of um, issues regarding uh, labor supply okay something that we will be talking about in this discussion so when we talk of labor supply let's uh, first understand that each of us must decide whether to work and once we are employed, we have to know how many hours we will be working. And at any point in time, the economy-wide labor supply is given by adding the work choices made by each person in the population. So it is um, a sum of all the decisions by the people living in a certain area, the entire population. And total labor supply also depends on the fertility decisions made by earlier generations which determine the size of the current population the economic and social consequences of these decisions vary dramatically over time in 1948 84 percent of american men and 31 percent of american women aged 16 or over worked and then by 2012 the proportion of working men had declined to 64 percent whereas the proportion of working women had risen to 53%. Over the same period, the length of the average work week in a private sector production job fell from 40 to 34 hours. These labor supply trends have surely altered the nature of the American family as well as greatly affected the economy's productive capacity. So this uh, chapter it actually talks about the framework that economists use to study labor supply decisions. Uh, in this framework, individuals seek to maximize the well-being by consuming goods such as fancy cars, nice home, and other leisure. Goods have to be purchased in the marketplace because most of us are not independently wealthy. We must work in order to earn the cash required to buy the desired goods. The economic trade-off is clear. We do not work. We can consume a lot of leisure. But we have to do without the goods and services that make life more enjoyable. If we do work, we will be able to afford many of these goods and services. But we must give up some of our valuable leisure time. So to further illustrate that, Let's look at this labor leisure model, which is um, one of the most important models when we talk about labor supply in economics. Okay, so he, here uh, you can see the model. Uh, it isolates the person's wage rate and income as the key economic variables that guide the allocation of time between labor market and leisure activities. In this chapter, we first use the framework to analyze static labor supply decisions, the decision that affect a person's labor supply at any point in time. We will also extend the basic model to explore how timing of leisure activities change it, uh, changes over the life cycle. So, to sum up what this uh, labor leisure choice model means is that when we put in as much hours as we can, we can see that um, the amount of income decreases. And that is surprising, okay? Because what we would normally think is that if we would work higher labor hours, we should be able to get more money. Uh, the reality with that is that it will hit a certain plateau, okay? And if we would uh, analyze practically speaking it would just not be realistic to earn more money by putting in more hours okay 
uh, in a normal um, person's working hours during a week, uh, a person spends around 40 hours, okay? And as you can see, the ideal hours are just around 30 and you would get $400. And as you spend more time, the amount of income you will be getting decreases, okay? Economically speaking, what this means is that if more people gives of more time or are able to give more time to work, then it would pull down the amount of salary that they will be offering because uh, everyone is able to put in as much hours as they would want, okay? And again, reality, uh, realistically, it does not work that way, okay? So, you can see the equilibrium or the ideal point being at around 30 to 40 hours per week, okay? And what's surprising is that the less uh, there are cases wherein lesser labor hours would yield higher income, okay? That's because um, it would pertain to certain skilled labor, okay? Or work that requires a, um, a specialized skill, okay? And for that, you would have to pay higher wages or higher income per hour, okay? So that's the um, explanation as to why the model works this way. And finally, what I would like to emphasize here is that the more labor hours you put in, okay, the lesser uh, leisure hours you would be able to utilize. And that's not what people would want, okay? They, uh, people want balance, okay? People want to be able to still enjoy a lot of things, okay? That's why if we would lessen the labor hours, that would mean more leisure hours for me or for anybody, okay? So again, these balances must be uh, found and maintained in any economic setting, in order for most work to work, okay? So, now let's go to um, the computations of labor force, okay? Individuals in eligible population, in our case, um, 18 and up in the Philippines, but there are uh, actual cases wherein uh, some people are able to find work even if they are below 18, okay? And most of it are part-time jobs, okay? Summer jobs. But uh, if they are able to put in work, they will be considered as part of the labor market, okay? Now, these workers can be either employed or unemployed. So, how do you get the labor force? Labor force is equal to employed plus unemployed. There are two important statistics when it comes to labor force. First, the unemployment rate. In order for you to get that, unemployment, uh, unemployment rate is equal to unemployed over labor force. Okay? And then, labor force participation rate. The fraction of eligible population, which is represented by P, or working age participation represented by WAP participating in the labor force. Participation rate is equals to labor force over P or WAP. So we just need to remember these um, formulas, okay? And most of the given are just, you know, um, available, okay, in any scenario. One of the other things that we have to consider in measuring the labor force are factors such as hidden unemployment. Uh, this means that people are not counted or considered as unemployed, although in reality they are unemployed or they should be considered as unemployed. That's why employment rate is a better indicator of fluctuations in economic activity. And the employment rate is what most economists and um, organizations, institutions use, okay, when gauging economic performance. 
One example we have here is uh, from Canada. And we can see their population in millions in 2013. You can see that at a uh, given time in 2013, their total population is 35.16 million. And then from that, you would deduct less under 15 years. So meaning these are people or people in the population that you will not consider under the labor force. Okay? And they are around 6.49 million. So when you less that from 35.16 million, you will have the working age population at 28.67%. Oh, sorry, not... Uh, you will have um, the working age population at 28.67 million. And then from there, you would also less or deduct those that are not in the labor force. So who are they? Uh, they could be below 15 years old. They could be retired. They could be wealthy. These could be uh, full-time students. And this could be workers that are already discouraged. Okay. Some would be hidden employment, just like what we have mentioned earlier. So you would less that from the WAP or working age population. And you will have the total labor force at 19.08 million. Now this labor force is divided into two categories, okay? Uh, employed and unemployed, okay? So let, let's say, um, oh, so... In out of 19.08 million, there were 17.73 million people who were employed and 1.55 million unemployed. Okay, so in order to get the unemployment rate, we are uh, as what we have discussed earlier, you would have to get unemployed and then divide it with the labor force. That's why 150. Uh, 1.55 over 19.08 multiplied by 100% and you will get the unemployment rate at 8.1%. As for the participation rate, all you would have to do is get the labor force and divide it with P or WAP or working age population. So we have labor force at 19.8 million over 28.67 which is the working age population multiplied by 100 and then we will get participation rate which is 66.6 percent so that is how economists are computing for the actual numbers okay in an economy and why is this very important okay we have the, that's the reason why we are studying this why why do we need to know the actual labor force okay so think of it this way okay labor force is an important economic measure because it represents the relative amount of labor resources available for the production of goods and services so think of it just like we are in a kingdom Okay, there is a king and you have all the people, you would count all your people, how many can you put in the military and how many can you put in production. Okay, we are one nation, we are governed by the president and all of the um, government officials, okay, working hand in hand and everyone must be accounted for we have to understand how many of uh, our total population are productive and willing and able to help us generate more money or generate um, funds okay in order for our economy to roll so again that's very important uh, i'm just giving you a general perspective or a wide perspective of things and um, and I've given you an, a similar example to how um, 
older civilizations or kingdoms work. Okay, so labor force, this is really important. And um, constantly the government is looking at employment rates, unemployment rates, and you can attest to that. Okay, if you would look in the news at any point, okay, um, economists would compare unemployment rate from the past uh, quarter, the past year, and if the unemployment rate is uh, lower, they would uh, celebrate. Okay, and put it out as an achievement. Okay, which should be okay. Just like uh, in the first quarter of 2022, uh, the unemployment rate is uh, lower as compared to uh, the the last quarters of 2021. Okay, so just like this data, uh, which was given to us by uh, Philippine Statistics Authority. Okay. So you can get this online. You can check it actually in Philippine Statistics Authority's website. And on their website, you can see um, a summary okay, of the labor force from 2020 up to the most recent, which is 2021. Now, I understand we are already in the first quarter of 2022, but this is the most um, recent data that's available in the website. And uh, PSA is the most credible uh, in terms of numbers because, they again, they are the statistics authority. Okay, we can uh, go ahead of the numbers that they are producing. Okay, they are the authority when it comes to this. So, according to them, you can see the population of 15 years old and over in millions. Okay, 74 uh, million seven hundred thirty-three thousand. Okay. Labor force participation rate is sixty point five. Employment rate is ninety-one point three percent. Underemployment rate is sixteen percent, and unemployment rate is eight point seven percent. And then we have data from October twenty twenty, July twenty twenty, April twenty twenty, and January twenty twenty. So basically, if we would com uh, compute okay, and see uh, the participation rate is much more lower during the first quarter of 2021. Uh, employment rate is also lower because again, remember January 2020, uh, the pandemic hasn't hit Philippines yet. Okay, so it, it hit around March. So the, the employment rate for those months would still be higher if you would compare it with the first quarter of 2021. Underemployment rate is um, higher, which is 16.0 versus 14.8. And unemployment rate is higher during the first month of 2021. So see, uh, these things are also being computed for locally. And um, this data is being used by the government to assess the country's performance, economically speaking. Now, uh, with this, I would be leaving you with an assignment, okay? And we already have the data. I have also included the total population of Filipinos, which is 110,881,756 as of January 21. Now, given this data, compute for the actual figures of the following. So, what is the total labor force? What is the total number of unemployed? And what is the total number of employed? So, you can easily answer this because the percentages are already available. Thank you so much and I hope you learned something from this discussion. I will see you on the next discussion.